Okay, good evening everybody. Thanks for coming. My talk is about why dark energy is obsolete in Einstein Dicke cosmology. And well, I think I should start with a caveat. Does this work? Ah. This is the so called standard model of cosmology. And if you're happy with this model, and if you say, oh, that's the precise percentage, everything is clear, that perfectly fits our data, and we have understood almost everything of the universe, then probably this, is talk, this talk is not for you. That's what we have from the guys from Princeton. How wonderful is our understanding? If instead you're skeptical and if you realize that dark energy was in first place uh, a remedy for an anomalous uh, observation of distant galaxies, and if you realize that often such a complication of a model is a sign of something we have overlooked, then I think I can present you a very interesting idea, the idea that could have been overlooked. And interestingly, it goes back to Einstein in 1911, when he started to think about light deflection. His very first idea was, well, that's an effect of variable speed of light. Masses do influence the speed of light, and for that reason, light rays can be curved. From the just proved assertion that the speed of light in gravity field is a function of position, it is easily deduced from Huygens' principle that light rays propagating at right angles to the gravity field must experience curvature. That was that are Einstein's word in his uh, paper, that was a precursor paper in 1907. And uh, it's very interesting that he did not uh, perform any longer this uh, description, because actually um, you can describe general relativity in two ways. One is um, a constant speed of light in a curved space, and the other thing is a flat space with a variable c. And these two versions are equivalent. Uh, just take another example of a curved space, Hamburg. I mean, uh, if you go from, from the southeastern part to the northwestern part, you, go, you don't go straight, okay? You take the roads. Why? Because you're going faster there. So take it, and, and this, the speed here is a variable. It's faster on the roads, and it's slower if you go on the smaller roads, and it's even slower if you go swimming. Um, but uh, it's, it's the same thing whether you say, I'm going the shortest path in a curved space, or I'm going the fastest path in a, in a flat space with variable velocity. This is even hidden in, in, in all conventional textbooks. There is, if, if you read it, there are, well, uh, uh, the, the authors also say you may also uh, look at the curvature in a way that the, there is a variable speed of light. I, I took these notes from a very interesting paper that uh, from a Belgian physicist, Brokert, he proved in another paper there is really a one-to-one -one correspondence for all classical tests of relativity. So, uh, why this version of general relativity is so unknown, that's a story of its own, and mostly because Einstein himself dismissed it, and I give it another talk about that, but um, here is just a uh, uh, an overview of what is necessary, this would indicate the, um, the uh, relation of the speed of light close to a mass with respect to uh, the speed of light distant to a mass. And you see that there is a little factor, a factor which slightly differs from 1, 1 plus gm over rc squared. And this factor is squared if you're talking about the speed of light. So, of course, if you have c equals lambda f, speed of light is always frequencies times wavelengths, 
this uh, change has to go also into the frequencies and into the um, into time scales and length scales and so to speak all physical quantities quantities are affected by this by this uh, variable speed of light so um, and the second reason why the, this version of this very first idea of, of uh, Einstein about general relativity wasn't developed because he did a little error and it's actually a factor two. You see here he considered just gm over rc squared and uh, the correct version would be a 2gm if you square these numbers and actually it took 50 years until this error was corrected by the American astrophysicist Robert Dickey. He's famous for having detected, having detected the cosmic microwave background, of course his attempt to detect it. And he's famous for another theory which is called Brown's Dickey theory, which has almost nothing to do with that. But a very interesting precursor paper in 1957 uh, where he first considered the, the speed of light theory and he corrected Einstein's error and said, okay, if you want to get the results of general relativity, we just assume the index of refraction, the relation of two speed of lights is 1 plus 2 gm over rc squared. That was one big insight, I think, Dickey had. The second big insight was that uh, this is a cosmology that would satisfy Mach's principle. And he said, uh, let's look at this term. The right hand side is related to the gravitational potential of the sun. Of, of the sun. So what about the left side, the number one? Does it have its origin in the remainder of matter of the universe? And I think that's a beautiful idea because it would relate uh, uh, the, the variable speed of light version of general relativity to Machian approach of cosmology in which you can calculate then also the gravitational constants, constant from first principles from the distribution of masses and that would be, that would be related to uh, both Ernst Mach and other ideas by Schrödinger and Schama. Unfortunately, <laughs> I have only one talk here of 15 minutes, and this is not the central. This is not the central issue I'm talking uh, today. Uh, Dicke did another third big thing, I think, and he wondered about cosmology and the Hubble redshift. And, as I said, uh, if, you, if you formulate general relativity with a lower speed of light in the vicinity of masses, so masses do influence the speed of light. And the consequence is very simple. If you have a bigger and bigger horizon in the cosmos, you have more masses, and the more masses decrease your speed of light in time. So a direct consequence of this Dicke's cosmology is that during cosmological evolution there is a decrease in the speed of light. Now what's the consequence of this? If you have a decrease of the speed of light, this decrease has to distribute to the wavelength and frequencies. So the local atoms would equally distribute, should go ahead here, would, the local atoms would equally distribute the change to frequencies and wavelength, but propagating light arriving from distant galaxies cannot, cannot change its wavelength. So if you look at the distant wavelength arriving from distant galaxies, and if you compare it to our local atoms subject to the decrease of the speed of light, we observe redshifted light. That's a very simple consequence, and he put it out in this later pages of his, 
of his paper and I think it's a terrific idea nobody knows about. Uh, that's he, well, it's, maybe it's a little bit awkwardly phrased, but uh, it's a simple consequence of Maxwell equations that if you have propagating light and, um, uh, and, and, the, and the speed of light decreases, then wavelengths must be, must be conserved. Now, if we have an alternative explanation for the redshift, you don't need expansion anymore. And that's the consequence of Dicke's cosmology. You don't need the Hubble expansion. You, obs you would observe a red redshifted light just, just if matter, so to speak, is at rest and light spreads and due to the larger horizon in your light bubble, the speed of light would continue to decrease and, and generate this, redshift, this effect of redshift. Now, eventually, how does that, uh, what consequences are here? That's maybe a little bit too detailed, but of course, again, you have to consider during cosmological evolution how all the, how uh, the changing light influences other, other quantities like uh, speed and even inertial mass. And there is another very interesting relation to uh, Paul Dirac's large number hypothesis. I also don't have the time now to go in detail there. And, but how does all this relate to, uh, to dark energy? Now, Dicke's cosmology in 1957, 1957 basically says C decreases due to the presence of masses. For that reason, C decreases during cosmological evolution. The wavelengths cannot change, but appear, appear longer. There is no material expansion, just a spread of light. And now we can understand the anomaly that, had been, that has been observed in the late 90s. Because how, uh, why, did, why did people postulate an acceleration of the expansion? Because the gravitational model said, okay, we have an expansion, and due to gravitational extraction, uh, due to gravitational attraction, this expansion has to, has to slow down. That's the model. That was the theory. Everybody did expect a slowdown of the Hubble expansion. But the slowdown was not there. The galaxies were just seemingly moving uh, moving away without any, without any deceleration. And for that reason, acceleration was postulated to compensate for the missing deceleration. So you, need, you don't need any cosmic acceleration. And if you look at this early data, um, well, the lower line says, okay, in our conventional model, there should be a, a, a decrease of the expansion. This is not observed, so let's postulate an acceleration. But the data is also in very good agreement with just no deceleration, no acceleration at all. This is a more recent plot. You see the green line. It does not perfectly fit the, but it's a very, very uh, close, a very close match just missing deceleration. And there is another interesting test. People are uh, comparing the, the angular size of galaxies with redshift. And there, again, a lot of anomalies show up. And you have to postulate the evolution of galaxies and, and, and this and that. And an interesting paper about the, about the angular size says uh, the standard model cannot be reconciled with the, with the, with the angular distance measurements of galaxies, okay? And there you also have a very simple model that fits. One of the models explores a very simple phenomenological explanation of the linear Hubble law in Euclidean static universe fits the angular size versus redshift dependence quite well, which is also approximately proportional to Z minus one. So I think there are a lot of hints 
that conventional cosmology has too many free parameters. I think there are a lot of hints that this could be a really good idea and uh, well, no, that's not really part of, the, of my talk. Yeah. Everybody says that we have to explain flatness, inflation explains flatness. Flatness would be a simple consequence of this sticky cosmology too. Okay? It's, the, the universe would be flat by definition. So I'd just like to mention this because Roger Penrose says that inflation is bullshit. Well, he says it with his own words, but... So, to summarize, einstein dickey cosmology based on Einstein's 1911 idea and Dickey's 1957 paper, it's equivalent to conventional general relativity for all tests, explains the Hubble redshift from first principles, no expansion of matter, just light spreads, no need for gravitational slowdown of the expansion, and consequently no need for dark energy. Additionally, it fits the angular size test, and for me, Maybe, maybe the, the biggest appeal is a conceptual simplicity of this model. Because if you go back to Hubble's observation in 1930, oh, galaxies are redshifted. So <laughs> at the very end, postulating an expansion was already an ad hoc assumption to fit the data, which was not understood. And the point of view of einstein dickey cosmology would give you a necessary reason for the redshift of galaxies. <coughs> we are severely underestimating Einstein's variable speed of light approach, his first idea, improved by Diggy, maybe it was the best one. I <coughs> wrote a couple of papers about this topic. You can get that from my web page. This is a paper in Annalen of Physik. It's, a, it's part of it and this is a popular book about physics, and my new book is actually about this topic. And I not only talked about obsolete dark energy, but of a close relation of this Einstein idea to Ernst Mach, to Erwin Schrödinger, to Dennis Schama, to Dicke. And, uh, well, that's my message, but I can imagine what you might think uh, a guy who claims that conventional cosmology is wrong and everything has to be reanalyzed, and that sounds like a bold claim. Okay? I'm aware of that, and I do also think if you want to really appreciate it, you have to go somehow into the details how it relates to, to Dirac's uh, large numbers and this. So I cannot maybe. Um, it's a bold claim, but what I can perfectly testify, and what is obvious, that there is a close relation from Einstein's paper, to Dicke's paper, to Dirac's paper, to Schrödinger's paper of 1925. You just look at the formulas and they are equal formulas. And this is literally unknown among today's cosmologists. So, what can I say? I did not prove that con conventional cosmology is wrong, but I think I did prove that cosmologists are ignorant about these papers. Thank you very much. <laughs>